once the steamboat has been invented, because a flatboat, they could take the flatboat, let me find my map again. Uh, my glasses on. There. They could take the flatboat down the river. So you get on the flatboat, we're gonna, run, we're gonna sail down the river. <laughs> lots of sun, lots of water, lots of beer, going all the way down the river. So here we are all the way down the river. Now we somehow have to get back up to where we started from so that we can get another bunch of cargo and take that cargo down the river on another flatboat. Before the steamboat, getting back up river involved uh, walking, perhaps riding a horse, uh, but it involves some long mode of transportation in order to get back up the river. Once the steamboats come along, the flatboat crews can take the flatboats down river, and then they break up the flatboat for lumber because they were pretty easy to put together in the first place, ride the steamboat back upstream to their original port, build another flatboat, and do it all over again. So the flatboats actually increase in profitability because the steamboat provides the return voyage. Yep. Allie, right? Yep. The steamboats or the flatboats? The steamboats, the steamboats are taking people, they're taking, they're taking um, some produce as well up and downstream. But if um, you go to New Orleans or St. Louis or go any place along the river, and there's every place along the river you can sit and watch, and you'll see today, you'll see the barges, which are basically metallic versions of the old flatboats. And they're ca carrying a lot of the cargo that still today goes down the Mississippi River. Um, the steamboats could take cargo, but they were really about transporting people up and down the river. Okay, all right, so now the problem with going up and down the river is that occasionally when you're going up and down the river, you're going to reach a point where you have a drop off if you're going down, or a rise if you're going up, right? So a lot of times the water is, river water is like this, but then sometimes you have, whoops, cliffs. And if you take a steamboat, Oh, I don't want to do this with something that would actually break. Here we go. Here's my steamboat. So here's our steamboat, and it's going along the water just fine, and then it gets to one of those cliffs. Oh, wouldn't work very well for a steamboat, right? And steamboats are not salmon. Steamboats can't go back up. <laughs> they can only go down and crash and burn. So what do we need? We get canals. So then we're going to get a whole bunch of canals constructed, and the canals allow this ability to go basically around the falls, the, the cliffs which create the falls. So this is a picture, it's out of your textbook, I think, um, of which one? Champlain and Erie Canal. And it's kind of hard to make out. This sheeny part here, this is water. So there's the water. There's your flatboats. Here you can see the locks. I'll show you how the locks work. Here along the side is a pathway, which is now a bike trail, which is really cool. There's a 336 mile bike trail that goes the whole length of the Erie Canal from Lake Erie to Albany, New York. I was going to do it, but I didn't get to. Anyway, um, so these paths here are where the animals, for instance, here's, I don't know, horses or donkeys or mules or something. Uh, the animals would walk along, and sometimes because they're pulling these flatboats along. So, okay, good. Here we go. This will repeat a few times. This is showing you how a canal works. I love this gift. It's so fun. Okay, so it's, this is not the beginning, but here we are in the middle. So the, the boat's floating in. They're going to close the locks behind it. So they close the downstream gate. And then the sluices, so it was underneath, I love that word, right there. So they're letting the water in, the water's rising. Once the water has risen to the next level, then they open the top gate, they nudge the mules, and they move the boat out. Okay, here we go again. So they open the downstream gate, they, they pull the boat, I don't know how I found this on the web, but I did a few years ago. <laughs> they pull the boat into the lock, they're gonna pull it in, then they're gonna close the lock behind the boat, then they're gonna open this little piece underneath the water. So the water comes in, and the water level slowly rises, and once the water levels are equal, they open the top gate, and the boat continues on out. Is that cool? Yeah, I love that thing. So, um, years ago, I don't remember how long now, we were in Massachusetts for vacation, more travel log, and went to the Pawtucket Canal. There's now a W in that, but at the time, historically, there was no W. And at the Pawtucket Canal in Massachusetts, you can actually ride on the boats as part of the national park system and go through the locks. And so they have a functioning lock there on the Pawtucket Canal. So we're on this boat. You can see the front of the boat. It's a motor boat, so that part's not terribly historic. Uh, and here's the national park ranger who's getting ready to close the lock. And you see how icky dirty this is? So here's the water. Here, see how icky dirty that is? That's because the water level is going to rise up and cover that icky dirty part. So he's going to close this lock. And then, how do they open the locks? Well, in history times, they had in order to open and close these locks, this is a huge, you can see this is a huge piece of lumber, right? So that's um, gotta be 12, at least 12 inch more, 15, 18 inch lumber, really thick. And so it takes two rangers to push it. They're, they're walking backwards, right? So they're using their legs to push with all their might uh, in order to move the lock into place because that lock is going against the water, right? It's pretty hard to move. So they're moving the lock into place and the water comes in, the water rises. They open the other lock and you float on away. It's really cool. Yep. Whoa, were there tolls charged? Not a plant, just a perfectly timed question. Yes, and the tolls, so this is uh, a picture, it's not as clear as it might be because I took it 15 years ago with an old camera. Uh, so this is a picture there at the Pawtucket Canal that shows the tolls that were charged. And what's interesting is to see that the toll that's charged depends upon what's the good that's being carried through. So, so it's not simply by weight, it's, it's by what it is. So timber is one price and shingles are another price and barrels are, or uh, white oak, whatever that says, is another price and so on. Yeah, yeah. If, there's an, if, there's a, if there's a mixture of goods, they're gonna know what's the mixture of goods and they're gonna charge based on that. It does, it takes a long time, <coughs> it, not the inventory that takes a long time. Um, that, pro that process for each boat, um, depending upon how big the lock is, can take uh, anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour or longer along these things. And through the Panama Canal, I think it takes even longer than that for the locks to fully rise. Yeah, but if you, if you had a boat, with, you would have a bill of lading on your, with you that would already have listed what's on your boat. These canals are by and large public. Uh, three fourths to two thirds of them. I don't know how this is working out this way, but it's brilliant. Three fourths to two thirds of these canals are funded with public money. Uh, and some of these canals are private. So, um, so for instance, let me jump to the very last slide. Whoops. Not that one. Not that one either. That one. Um, so this is down later. It's not the last slide, but it's going to This is showing Lowell, Massachusetts. And here comes the Pawtucket Canal here uh, in off the Merrimack River. So this is where the, the National Park part is. And the locks are going in. But then you see all of this white that I'm about to, to do with my pen. These are also canals. So these little canals here, these are going to be private canals. So there's going to be a major canal that takes you in. And then the little spurs that go off that go to a particular company so that that particular company can easily get its goods out of its warehouse. They're going to have a canal that comes right up to the back of the warehouse. So they're gonna, that piece, the company's going to pay for. Yep. The, the tolls, so with a toll standard, the, the private canals are, there's not gonna be a toll on the private canal because it's, it's the Mary Mac Company's canal which comes to the Mary Mac Company's building and they built it so they wouldn't have to pay anybody to get their goods to the Pawtucket Canal. All right, okay. 
Um, principal canals of the antebellum period. So we've got these canals are going to connect us to the river. So coming from Lake Erie, we've got one that goes along the Miami, which is spelled oddly here. Ma, ma, well, it's spelled the way it's spelled, but it means Miami. Ma, ami, ma, ami, river. And comes the Wabash and Erie comes down and connects to the Ohio. There's the Miami and Ohio Canal comes down from Lake Erie and connects to the Ohio. There's the Ohio and Erie Canal comes down and connects to the Ohio River. There is, and the big one that we'll talk about is the Erie Canal. And the Erie Canal is going from Lake Erie all the way east along basically what's now I-90 uh, to Albany, which is where I live right there, uh, to Albany, New York, where it meets up with the Champlain Canal and the Hudson River. So this canal, the Erie Canal, is one of the most famous canals, and its financing came largely from bonds, a lot of it from foreign investment. So there was a lot of people from, from England and Europe who bought the bonds, that is, lent the money to construct the Erie Canal. It turned out to be a, a smart and profitable uh, thing to do and had a huge impact on economic activity in upstate New York. And it's still there today. So you can go, you can see it, you can go to the locks, you can have an annoying mother like me who says, come on, let's get in the car, go look at the locks, this is really cool. Oh my god, mom, really? Yes, we're going. Um, you can bike along it, there's a bike path all the way along. Uh, but what did the Erie Canal do? So here's 1820 on the left, before the Erie Canal is built. And the darker shades are showing you the counties that had high production, so highest home production of woolen goods. This picture is from your textbook. So it's showing you the counties in New York, so this is the state of New York. Um, and it's showing you which counties had a lot of household production. So these are people who, within their family, they're producing wool. They have sheep, they shear the sheep, they turn the sheep wool stuff into wool, they make wool to make cloth, and so on. And you can see it sort of scattered around. And then the Erie Canal comes in, and what happens? All of these states that used to be home, that used to have houses, homes, let me back that up, all of these counties that used to have families that were manufacturing, doing home manufacture of wool, are no longer manufacturing wool. The wool manufacturer states shift to the, wool manufacturer counties shift to the counties away, oh, I think it was one, shift to the counties away from the Erie Canal, and the counties that border the Erie Canal are no longer producing wool. Why? Opportunity cost. Because now, the opportunity cost of producing wool in the home is that's less time that's available to produce wheat. And the production of wheat is now much more profitable once the Erie Canal is put in place because it's much cheaper now to get the wheat to market. With the introduction of all of these canals, you can, first off, these, the Erie Canal means that these farmers can ship their wheat east and then down through Manhattan, or they can ship their, their goods to the west because their goods can go along the Erie Canal, through Lake Erie, down any of these three canals to hook up with the Ohio River, down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi, and out into the Port of Mexico. So the canal, and particularly the Erie Canal and then any of these three canals that connect you up to the Ohio River, allow for trade from upstate New York to dang near any place in what's then the United States. And so the result of that is a loss of home production in these counties, a shift to production for market. And when we read Joan Hannon's article next week, which looks at poor relief in upstate New York, this becomes a really important part of the story. Because now you've got more and more and more families whose economic activity is geared toward the market, which means they are subject to the fluctuations of the market and subject to periods of unemployment when they may need uh, relief, when they may need a social safety net. So Erie Canal, huge effect. All right, what else do we got? Railroads, 20, 10 minutes, I can do this. Railroads, uh, the big story of railroads really comes after the Civil War. The story before the Civil War, there are railroads that are built. They start being built around 1830. There's a, a, a real surge in construction of railroads here in the 1850s, but it's not until the mid-1860s, the late 1860s, when we get the Transcontinental Railroad. So all of these railroad lines that are being built in the antebellum period are at most regional lines, uh, and a lot of them are local. So a lot of the railroad lines that are being built, and when they talk about 31,000 miles, you think, wow, that's a lot. But a lot of those are spurs that go from the main line to one particular warehouse or one particular silo. Uh, and so it may be three miles worth of railroad that's used by only one company to get their products to market. So these railroads, um, the financing of these railroads varied by region in New England. Because there were a lot of canals, there was not a lot of need for, for railroads. Uh, state and local governments uh, supplied less than 10% of the funding for the railroads in New England. In the South, where there's a lot more need to get products, particularly cotton by this time, to market, uh, about 50% of the construction of railroads in the South is funded by government funding, public funding as opposed to private funding. So New England, you've got a lot of these little spurs that are going to particular com companies. You also have a huge system of canals. Uh, in the South, you have much more state and local financing. Okay. What's the effect of these transportation costs? Well, the effect of these transportation costs is to lower prices. So supply and demand, good old supply and demand, price on the vertical, quantity on the horizontal. And we're going to look at the effect on wheat prices. So our price here is the price of wheat. Wheat's a major product in this period. Draw yourself a downward sloping demand curve. We're only going to have one demand, so D is fine. Draw an upward sloping supply curve labeled S1. And S1, we're going to say that's the supply of wheat if transportation costs were zero. So that's basically the farmer's costs ignoring transportation. So this is uh, with transportation costs equal to zero. Transportation, however, did not cost zero. Transportation had a cost to it. So let's draw a second curve, supply two, where we add on the transportation cost. Make it well above. We're going to need one in the middle. So put a big jump there because you're going to need space to have one in the middle. So supply two is the first supply curve plus the initial transportation costs. The equilibrium price is going to be where your supply curve, S2, hits your demand curve. That's the price that's going to be paid by the consumers. So we'll call that price 1C. So that's the price paid by the consumers. That's the initial price paid by the consumers because they have to cover the transportation costs as well. The transportation costs, however, are captured by the transportation people and not by the farmer. And so drop straight down from your P1C until you get back to your initial supply curve, S1. That's the supply curve with no transportation costs. Dash that over, and that we're going to call P1F. That's the price the farmer receives. So there's a wedge in between the price the consumer pays and the price the farmer receives, and that wedge represents the transportation costs. With the lowering of transportation costs through the introduction of all these things we just talked about, what does that do? We're going to have S3 is going to be S1 plus the new lower transportation costs. So draw yourself a second supply curve any place in the middle between S1 and S2. doesn't matter where. Find your new equilibrium point. Dash it over. That's the new price to the consumer. So the lowering of transportation costs lowers the price to consumers, but dash it down. Also allows the farmer to capture a higher price. So dash it down until you hit S1. Dash it over P2 to the farmer. The farmer captures a higher price as well. So when the transportation costs go down, both the farmers and the consumers gain. The consumers are paying a lower price. The farmers are keeping a higher price because they don't have to turn as much over to the transportation company. Uh, and, and both people gain. We see this in the data. We see it in the comparison of wheat prices and other prices by comparing the price of these goods in Cincinnati, which is basically at the farm gate, 
they call them farm gate prices. So this would be the equivalent of the price to the farmer. Uh, with the price in Philadelphia, there's not wheat production in Philadelphia. So the price in Philadelphia, that's essentially the price to the consumer. So as the, the wedge decreases, as the consumer and the farmer price become closer together, this ratio of the farmer's price to the consumer's price is going to get closer to 100. And that's exactly what we see. So you can see um, the extreme, for instance, here, 1820 uh, flour, the farmer is getting about 50% of the total price in 18, uh, 1820s, and by the 1850s, he's getting nearly 90% of the total. Uh, a very important decrease in that transportation wedge. Same thing is true for corn. Uh, same thing is true, although not so pronounced, for whiskey. And it's really true for whiskey only if you look at 1820 versus later. So it looks like whiskey prices don't respond as much to the later transportation developments as flour and corn prices do. Okay. I've been talking a lot about agriculture. Three minutes, I can do it. I've been talking a lot about agriculture, um, but at the, this period, that is in the antebellum period, we also are having the beginnings of manufacturing. So we saw the effect of Erie Canal on home manufacturers. Um, if we look at what was being produced in the United States in 1790 and 1860, one of the more interesting things about this table is that it's exactly the same in 1790 as it is in 1860. I will show you this table of the top 10 products again with 1910 data in several weeks. It mixes up, it changes. So from 1790 to 1860, we're a developing nation. We're expanding our land boundaries. We're developing transportation, but there's not a lot of change in the manufacturing side of things. There's not a whole lot of the story on the manufacturing side. We are producing more and more manufacturers, but there's not a change in the mix. So number one is cotton goods. Cotton is very important. We'll talk about cotton in the South on another day. Cotton goods are very important. 1790, 1860, all the way through this antebellum period, cotton goods are number one. Lumber is number two. A lot of what we looked at requires lumber, steamboats, burning wood, railroad ties made of lumber. All of this stuff is being constructed with lumber. So lumber's number two. Boots and shoes, flour and meal, which comes from agriculture. Boots and shoes coming from leather from the cow. Men's clothing. We have to get down here to six and seven to iron and machinery before we start to get things that you might associate with um, manufacturing. Um, primary forms of manufacturing. This is covered pretty well in the textbooks. I'm going to skip it and jump to the fourth. Household manufacturers, things we make in the home. We'll come back and talk about that more when we talk about cannon. Craft shops and artisans, so individual people who are bootsmiths or blacksmiths or whatever. Mill industry, so uh, places that are on the river where they're dependent upon the movement of the water um, to, to make things happen and they are processing, processing goods. You can sit down for a second. I have um, still one minute. I'm going to use it. Thanks. Always. Every day. Um, factory production. Factory production means lots of standardized output that's produced for a wide market. Complex operations in one or more buildings. I'm going to skip that picture. And an assembly of workers under some sort of organizational discipline. So I showed you the map before when I was looking at the canals of the Lowell uh, manufacturing area. So that's a major manufacturing area in Massachusetts. The assembly of workers, women were an important part of the labor force. We'll talk about why on another day. The, the discipline, this is the timetable. So this is saying what time? What time do you have to be to work? This is a.m. So in January, first bell at 5 a.m. In February at 4.30 a.m. In April, May, 4.30 a.m. See you then. Have a good weekend.